Welcome to the fifth session of our course on Greek history and civilization, about 700 BC to about 500 AD. This week I want to talk about the end of the Great Persian War. It's not the end of hostilities between the Greeks and Persians. Indeed, there will be a very substantial rematch between the Greeks and Persians about 150 years after this, but that is another story. The cover slide is one of my artificial intelligence masterpieces. It looks rather good, so long as you don't look too closely at it. It is a Greek fleet. You'll notice that the ships are rather crowded with rowers, and there's not much firepower on these things. Most Greek sea battles, most ancient sea battles, were fought by ramming. What you did was you went straight at the middle of the enemy ship, and you broke it in half, and then you shot arrows at the survivors who didn't drown. It's only later that ballistic weapons of any kind were put on these boats. So that's what sea battles are like. These ships could move very quickly, by the way. It's the sea which was the undoing for the Persians. They lost control of the sea, and that brought about the sudden and total collapse of the Persian war effort. But we'll come to that. For the moment, let's refresh our memories as to what has been happening. In the summer of 480 BC, Xerxes, the great king of Persia, has invaded Greece at the head of several hundred thousand men. Between 300 and 500,000, or according to the ancient historians, between 3 and 5 million men. You can't get 3 million men into northern Greece so I'm assured, and it strikes me as entirely reasonable. Before he invaded, Xerxes has sent ambassadors to all of the Greek cities, all of the Greek states, asking for a preliminary surrender. He's asking for gifts of earth and water. Most of the Greek cities do send this back because it's really an offer that they can't refuse. They don't believe that they can stand up to the great king of Persia when he comes knocking at the head of an army that size. Better spare your city and just give him what he wants. 31 Greek states refused to send earth and water, and the two leading states, Athens and Sparta, were not asked to send earth and water. Remember, Xerxes has a triple grudge against the Athenians, they assisted in the revolt of the Greek cities against his father Darius in 500. They then murdered his father's ambassadors when they turned up asking for earth and water. The Athenians did that, and so did the Spartans. He also has a grudge against the Athenians because they saw off his father's first invasion force at Marathon, so he didn't bother asking the Athenians for earth and water. But most of the Greek states he approached did give him what he wanted. 31 minus Athens and Sparta, that makes 29, refused. They met in Corinth, they signed a treaty, they became the League of Corinth, and they decided to fight. The Athenian idea was to hold out in the passes by Mount Olympus. Remember, Xerxes is leading an army so vast that it can't be provisioned by stripping the territories clean that he went through. He had to bring a great deal of food with him, and so he was on a timetable. He had to win the war before he ran out of food. Holding him up for any length of time would cause the invasion to collapse. The Athenian plan A was to hold the passes by Mount Olympus. When it turned out that that was not possible, the Athenians decided Thermopylae, that's the place. The Spartans didn't want to send an army north of the Peloponnese. Their idea was to hold the Isthmus of Corinth. Eventually, after much, shall we call it discussion, the Spartans sent a very small force to Thermopylae, which was supposed to keep things ready for when a larger force would arrive, but the Persians 
arrived at Thermopylae rather faster than anybody expected. They rolled over the very small force of defenders at Thermopylae, not without much heroism on the part of the Greeks, we must accept, but Thermopylae was a defeat for the Greeks, there's no denying that. The Persians rolled over the Greek defenders at Thermopylae, and then nothing lay between them and Athens. The Athenians had no choice but to evacuate the city and ferry the whole population across the Saronic Gulf to Salamis and to Aegina. Xerxes then took Athens, he burned it. After that, he moved his base to Piraeus, the port of Athens, and he waited. He waited for the members of the League of Corinth to come to him individually with their surrenders. However, he waited and waited, and nobody came. So what is going on? Let's look at the dramatis personae again. I showed you this last week. You have four principal actors in this war. You have Xerxes, of course, the great king of Persia. He's still alive in 480. Themistocles, the Athenian politician. He's still alive. Pausanias, the Spartan general, who did very good service at the Battle of Plataea a year later. He's still alive. Leonidas, however, one of the kings of Sparta, one of the two kings of Sparta, is now dead. He died at the Battle of Thermopylae, of course, so the Spartans are won down on their kings. Now let's look in some detail at Themistocles, the Athenian politician. Athens was a democracy. It was an increasingly radical democracy, and it was a democracy of a peculiar kind. It was possible for any adult male citizen to go along to meetings of the assembly held in the central marketplace in Athens and to vote on such measures as were put to the assembly and, if he felt so inclined, to get up and speak for or against them and, indeed, to put measures before the assembly and almost the whole of Athenian policy and most Athenian law was decided by the assembly of the people. What makes their democracy very radical is not just that it was a direct democracy in which the people turned out once or twice a month and voted, but virtually all executive positions in the Athenian government were filled by lot, not by election, the Greeks would have regarded our elections as a bit of a stitch-up. I think I said a few weeks ago that if you want to stand for Parliament, let's say, you need the endorsement of one of the main political parties, and they do vet their candidate lists very closely. You need to be acceptable to the media. If you've said or done anything that can be used against you, it will be used against you ruthlessly by the media, and you also need to be broadly friendly to, to the various financial interests in this country. If you can pass all those hurdles, then your name will go seriously before the people, and they can choose you or somebody else who is probably interchangeable with you. In Athens, if they needed somebody to be in charge of fire regulations in the city, or somebody to manage the water supply, or somebody to look after the libraries, or somebody to manage the treasury of a temple, they pulled names out of a hat. Your name would come out of the hat, and you would get this job for six months. There'd be audits to make sure at the end of your term of office that you hadn't accepted bribes or stolen the money that you were looking after. And if you were notably incompetent, you could be impeached before one of the courts with those very large juries selected by lot. So they were safeguards, but it did mean that probably a majority of the people attending the meetings of the assembly did have administrative and indeed executive experience in the government of their city. So Athens was a radical democracy. It was a place where the people decided everything. I must say that the definition of people is rather 
more restrictive than we would regard as acceptable nowadays. You had to be an adult male citizen. A male, no women, and you had to be a citizen, and citizenship was confined to those people who could show unbroken ancestry from a long time back. But within those limits, it was a radical democracy. And Themistocles was one of the favourites in the assembly. It didn't mean that anyone had elected him to office. It didn't mean that he held a formal position which gave him authority in the assembly. No, his authority within the assembly was based on the fact that he was a very persuasive speaker, and what he persuaded the Athenians to do usually made good sense before, during, or after the event. So Themistocles can be regarded as the leading Athenian politician at this time. Came from an insignificant background, but if you remember the bit I read from the great funeral speech of Pericles, the Athenians didn't care that much about somebody's background. What they cared about was what he was able to do now. Themistocles may have been one of the Athenian generals at Marathon. There are some claims he was and some silences, but probably he was one of the men who fought at Marathon. Remember that shortly after the Battle of Marathon, a large seam of silver was discovered just outside Athens at Laureon. The first idea of the Athenian assembly was that the proceeds of this silver mine should be distributed among the citizens, which would have been rather nice. But Themistocles persuaded the assembly not to do this, but instead to build a large modern fleet that would make Athens the leading naval power in the Aegean Sea, after the Persians, of course, but it would make Athens the leading naval power in Greece. The assembly agreed with him, and a large new fleet went into commission. After 490, Themistocles advocated continual naval expansion. He wanted a much larger fleet to be built. He also wanted Piraeus to be made ready as the main port of Athens. Until then, if you look at this map on the right, the main port of Athens had been at a place called Phalerum, which is all right as a port. But Piraeus, as long as it's made ready in the right way, is a much better port because it has two harbours. It's also much more easily defended because part of it counts as an island. Themistocles is responsible for the building of a large and powerful Athenian fleet. He's also responsible for the building of a new port at Piraeus. Notice these long walls, indeed that's what they're called, they're the long walls. They're about 15 miles long, no they're not, I think they're about 8 miles long. What they did was they connected Athens to Piraeus, and because the road was protected on both sides by a wall, it meant that Athens ceased to be an inland city, and suddenly became a coastal city, because you could walk in complete safety from Athens down to the sea, as long as you stayed within those long walls. So Themistocles is a man of the highest significance for Athenian strategy all through the rest of the century, and indeed for Athenian strategy right down until the Roman conquest. There at the bottom, you have some images of the silver coins produced by the Athenians with the proceeds of these silver mines. And very quickly, the Athenian coinage became one of the standard monies of the Eastern Mediterranean world. You'll find these coins buried all over the Eastern Mediterranean. Indeed, you'll find hordes of them in the Western Mediterranean, you'll certainly find them all through southern Italy. It was a very widely used money. At this point, we need to look at one of the less pleasant aspects of Greek life, the fact that those silver mines were worked with slave labour. 
Here is Diodorus Siculus writing in the 2nd century BC, when the Athenian silver mines were still in use, and he says, The slaves who are engaged in the working of these mines produce for their masters revenues in sums defying, defying belief, but they themselves wear out their bodies both by day and by night in the diggings under the earth, dying in large numbers because of the exceptional hardships they endure, for no respite or pause is granted them in their labours, but compelled beneath blows of the overseers to endure the severity of their plight, they throw away their lives in this wretched manner, although certain of them who can endure it by virtue of their bodily strength and their persevering souls suffer such hardships over a long period. Indeed, death in their eyes is more to be desired than life, because of the magnitude of the hardships they must bear. Though silver mines were worked with slave labour, and although we can celebrate, although we can even be grateful for the fact that Themistocles had that large fleet built, because without that large fleet we might not be here today, or if we were, we would probably not be speaking English, we can also be glad that he diverted the proceeds of those silver mines to building the fleet. But the silver mines were not pleasant things. They were worked with slave labour, and during the breakdown at the end of the great Peloponnesian War between Athens and Sparta, Thucydides reports that I think 40,000 slaves escaped from the silver mines. Now, Nobody was counting the numbers, but it tells you that very large numbers of men worked out their lives in the most disgusting conditions to furnish the Athenian state with that silver. And do bear in mind that a silver mine is also a lead mine. Silver and lead are found together, so they would die very quickly of lead poisoning. There's then another thing that's worth quoting on slavery. Here is an extract from Galen on passions and errors of the soul from the 2nd century AD, and this tells you much about the Greek view of slavery. When I was a young man, I imposed upon myself an injunction which I have, have observed through my whole life, namely never to strike any slave of my household with my hand. My father practised this same restraint, and you think, ah, there you are, there's someone who's rather nice, but then he was one of the leading medical writers of the ancient world, and you do expect a certain humanity on his part. But then you read further. Many were the friends he reproved when they had bruised a tendon while striking their slaves in the teeth. He told them that they deserved to have a stroke and die in the fit of passion which had come upon them. They could have waited a little while, he said, and used a rod or whip to inflict as many blows as they wished, and to accomplish the act with reflection. I think I said in the first session that we must see the Greeks as they were, not as we would like them to have been. You can look at the Athenian radical democracy and be smitten with admiration for how this democratic system lasted for the better part of 400 years, and you can be astonished by the intellectual achievements of the Greeks, but at the same time they were a nation of slave owners, and they were not notably generous in their treatment of their slaves. The Romans were much more generous. The Romans would enfranchise their slaves, they would free their slaves on such a large scale that the imperial government actually imposed a tax on the manumission of slaves, and raised a substantial revenue from it. I'm not saying the Romans were particularly nice either, but they were nicer than the Athenians, a rather tight-fisted lot, the Athenians, the Greeks in general, where their slaves were concerned. Themistocles diverted the proceeds of the silver mine to building a great fleet, which was of critical importance in the fight back against the Persian invasion. But every one of those rather pretty coins that you see in a museum is soaked in the sweat of those unfortunate slaves who worked out their lives digging through lead to get at the silver. But as I said, you have to see the Greeks as they were. 
They were slavers, yes, but they were also radical Democrats. You must give them credit as well as blame for what they were and for what they did. The crisis. Remember, there was nothing between Thermopylae and Athens. The Athenians sent, with some desperation, to the oracle at Delphi. The priestess told them, it's all up. Get in your ship, sail away, build an Athens somewhere else. Good luck. The assembly didn't like that particular oracle, so sent the representatives back with instructions not to leave the temple precincts until a better oracle was delivered. And at last they were told, you might get through this, but look to your wooden walls. That was taken back to Athens. Its meaning was debated. I think I said last week that Delphi was famous or perhaps notorious for giving oracles that did not make complete sense at the time. The consensus, once Themistocles had made his speech, was that the god was telling them to rely on the fleet. A small minority insisted that they could build a wooden fence around the Acropolis and that would keep the Persians out. But the majority decided to evacuate Athens. Almost the entire population was shipped across the Saronic Gulf to Salamis and Aegina. And Athens ceased to be a territorial thing. It became a nation on sea. Athens became the Athenian fleet. Athens itself was given up to the Persians. The Persians got to Athens. They got onto the Acropolis. They killed the defenders. They burned the temples. They smashed the statues. Anything particularly pretty or valuable was taken off to Persepolis as booty. Some of it was liberated about 150 years later by Alexander the Great and sent back to Athens, but for the moment the Acropolis was stripped clean and the lower part of Athens was burned. That was the end of Athens. So all that remains of Athens at the moment is the fleet, nothing more, and the fleet is under Spartan control. Remember dissensions, dissensions, the Greeks can't agree on their strategy. The Spartans have not given up by any means on their plan of digging in across the Isthmus of Corinth and defending the Peloponnese, which means abandoning the whole of central and northern Greece to the Persians. The Spartans want to build a wall across the Isthmus of Corinth. They want to dig trenches and they want to hold that as long as they can. The Athenians are not convinced by this, quite obviously, because Athens will be rather north of those fortifications. But you have two Spartans in charge of both land and naval defence. You've got Pausanias, a Spartan, in charge of the army, and you have Eurybiades, another Spartan, in charge of the navy. The Spartans want to withdraw the whole Greek fleet from Salamis, this island up here, just to the southwest of Athens. They want to withdraw the whole Greek fleet to cover the defence of Corinth. At this point, Themistocles stands up in the meeting of the League of Corinth and announces that if the order is given to withdraw the combined Greek fleet from Salamis, then the Athenians will withdraw from the defence of Greece and they will convey the entire Athenian people to build a new city in Italy. They will just abandon the defence of Greece. They've accepted that Athens will be burned and looted, but they do want to get Athens back at some point. The Spartans show zero interest in that. So the Athenians drop their little atom bomb. If we don't fight the Persians at Salamis, you can fight them at Corinth, but without us. Eurybiades, the Spartan admiral, gives in at this point and agrees that the combined fleet will be kept at Salamis and it will be made ready for battle with the Persian fleet. 
I've said several times the Spartans hardly ever showed any particular regard for Greece as a whole. The only regard they ever showed was for the Peloponnese because that's where they lived. On this occasion, however, they found that they had no choice but to fight the war north of the Peloponnese. Salamis. August 480. Athens has been taken and burned. Xerxes is giving up on his long wait for the Greeks to come individually with offerings of earth and water, and he's preparing for an assault on Corinth. He's occupied the Piraeus and Phalerum. He has those two first-class ports, and he will use those as a base for his operations against the Peloponnese. He has suspended operations for the moment. You can call it a ceasefire. He's waiting for the Greeks to surrender. But when there is no general surrender, and because the season is moving on, and his food supplies are beginning to dwindle, he has to order a killing blow against the Greeks, a killing blow as he thinks. He is beset every day by his quartermasters with reports of how much food is left to feed this vast army that he's brought along. The large navy that he's brought along to support his army is incapable of bringing in supplies sufficient to keep the army fed. He's got to finish this war and get out of Greece before the autumn. If he waits too long, he will have serious problems. So, at last, towards the end of August, the Persian navy sets out from those two Athenian ports to attack the Greek fleet. And the Persians know that the Greek fleet, the combined Greek fleet, is drawn up by the island of Salamis. The Persians move slowly because Xerxes is rather uncertain with his direction of this naval operation, and the Greeks are still shouting at each other. It is still not absolutely certain that the Greek fleet will be kept at Salamis. And at this point, Themistocles decides to jog Xerxes' arm. And here is what Herodotus says. At this point, Themistocles, feeling that he would be outvoted by the Peloponnesians, slipped quietly away from the meeting and sent a man over in a boat to the Persian fleet with instructions upon what to say when he got there. The man, Sikinus, was one of Themistocles' slaves and used to attend upon his sons, that is, he was a tutor. Afterwards, when the Thespians were enrolling new citizens, Themistocles established him at Thespia and made him a rich man. Following his instructions then, Sikinus made his way to the Persian commanders and said, I am the bearer of a secret communication from the Athenian commander, who is a well-wisher to your king and hopes for a Persian victory. He has told me to report to you that the Greeks are afraid and are planning to slip away. Only prevent them from slipping through your fingers, and you have at this moment an opportunity of unparalleled success. They are at daggers drawn with each other, that's true enough, and will offer no opposition. On the contrary, you will see the pro-Persians amongst them fighting the rest. It sounds to us a rather unlikely story, but I did say last week that the Greeks had very limited team spirit, Xerxes' army was filled with exiles from Athens and Sparta and all the other Greek states. Remember, the Persians held open house in Persepolis and their other capitals for Greek refugees. If you did badly in some local political contest in Greece and Greece itself became too hot for you, you would slip across the Aegean and obtain asylum at the court of the great king and if you're a person of quality you might find yourself a personal friend of the great king now because of this and because it was well known that the greeks didn't like each other the greek city-states didn't like each other the persians found this an entirely convincing story so they thought great this is our opportunity to finish the greeks off for once and all and then they will surrender 
If a Roman deserter had told anybody such a strange story, he'd probably have been disbelieved. But, as I said, the Greeks were notoriously disloyal to each other. One of their weaknesses, but again, it's part of what the Greeks were. The Persians had every reason to believe this story, and they made the necessary dispositions. And so, at the end of August 480 BC, the Persians decided to attack the combined Greek fleet. Or not necessarily to attack it, it's just to make a stab at it and wait for it to fall to pieces. The problem for the Persians is that they didn't have proper maps of the region. They didn't know what they were going into. But here is a plan of the battle. This very large Persian fleet will come on in three lines. It will sail into the Bay of Salamis and surround the Greeks until they surrender, or there might be a small battle, but this will be the killing blow. That is the Persian plan. What the Persians don't know is that the waters of Salamis are very narrow. It's very difficult to manoeuvre a large fleet in those waters, and what else they don't know is that the Greeks are waiting for them. Here is an account by Aeschylus in his play The Persians, and Aeschylus was there at the Battle of Salamis, so this counts as an eyewitness report. At first, all was well with the Persian fleet. Their enormous mass held strong against the Greek onslaught, but then they all entered the narrow straits. Hundreds of them pressed hard up against each other. Our own ships, he's speaking from a Persian viewpoint, our own ships crashed against our own ships, none of them able to assist the other. Our own ships smashed our own oars. Our own prows smashed our own figureheads. Then the Greeks seized that moment, and all together, and with great precision, surrounded us and rushed at us from all angles, and tipped our ships over. You could not see the water from all the wreckage and the slaughtered men. An ocean of calamities broke upon the Persians, Xerxes groaned at the sight of the disaster, the enormous depth of it. He had his throne set up high on a mountain near the shore so he could observe the whole battle. He groaned and tore his royal robes and shouted wildly at his commanders to have the Persian fleet leave the place. He too left in great disarray. That's what Aeschylus says, and he was there. He fought in the battle. He had every reason to know how the battle went. Here you have a parallel account from Herodotus. Xerxes watched the course of the battle from the base of Mount Aigalios across the strait from Salamis. Whenever he saw one of his officers behaving with distinction, he would find out his name, and his secretaries wrote it down together with his city and parentage. Xerxes was quite a spectator of battles, you may remember, that he had a throne set up from which he observed the battle at Thermopylae, standing up three times in vexation on one morning at the progress or the lack of progress of his soldiers. And for what he thought was his killing blow against the Greeks, he had himself put on a golden throne on a high point, surrounded by his courtiers, so he could watch the sea battle. Instead, what he watched was the total destruction of his fleet. Artemisia, a queen from Asia Minor, was leading a contingent of ships in the great king's service. Her only way of escaping was to pretend to be in a Greek ship, and so she attacked the Persian ships and fought her way out of the Bay of Salamis, Xerxes didn't hold it against her. He admired her courage and resolution. But there's one of my artificial intelligence generated images of Xerxes looking rather calm as he watches his fleet go up in flames. It probably didn't go up in flames. As I said, Greek naval warfare at this time involved ramming enemy ships and sinking them. But you get the idea that what the Persians had confidently expected to be an easy victory turned out to be a defeat, and it turned out indeed to be a catastrophic defeat. It is late in the season, 
Xerxes is running out of food and he has now lost control of the sea. It's no longer possible for him to send orders to his army throughout Greece and it's no longer possible to receive reports. It also means that such supplies as can be brought in by sea are no longer forthcoming. Xerxes has waited too long in Greece. He's lost control of the sea. He's got to get out. There's no point trying for a land battle. It won't work. He's got to go. And so as soon as the Battle of Salamis was over and it was clear that the Persians had lost, he has to retreat with the bulk of his army along the path of advance. He does leave quite a large army behind in Greece. It may have been 50,000 or 100,000 men, which could be just about supported, but the bulk of his army must be withdrawn as quickly as possible. And here is what Herodotus says. Xerxes, when he realised the extent of the disaster, was afraid that the Greeks, either on their own initiative or at the suggestion of the Ionians, might sail to the Hellespont and break the bridges there. If this happened, he would be cut off in Europe and in danger of destruction. Accordingly, he laid his plans for escape. But at the same time, in order to conceal his purpose, both from the Greeks and from his own troops, he began to construct a causeway across the water towards Salamis, lashing together a number of Phoenician merchantmen to serve at once for bridge and breakwater. He also made other preparations, as if he intended to fight again at sea. The sight of this activity made everybody confident that he was prepared to remain in Greece and carry on the war with all possible vigour. There was, however, one exception, Mardonius, who thoroughly understood how his master's mind worked and was in no way deceived. At the same time, Xerxes dispatched a courtier to Persia with news of this defeat. It didn't help. Xerxes started the long trek back through Greece. No food at all, because they had stripped the land clean on their advance, and now on their retreat they were moving through a desert. Much of his army began to starve, and with starvation came disease. And by the time he reached the straits that separate Europe from Asia, the majority of his army appears to have died from famine and disease. Xerxes then discovers that his great bridge of boats has been destroyed by another storm. He has no choice but to start ferrying the pitiful remains of his great army across the straits by whatever boats can be procured. And here's another little extract from Herodotus. During the passage, this is the passage of Xerxes across the straits, during the passage they were caught by a strong wind blowing from the south of the Streamon, accompanied by a heavy sea. In the worsting weather, the ship, her deck covered with a crowd of Persians who were accompanying the king, was in considerable danger, and Xerxes, in sudden fright, called out to the ship's master to ask if there was any way of getting out of it alive. None whatever, my lord, the man replied, unless we can rid ourselves of this crowd on deck. Upon this, Xerxes is supposed to have said, Men of Persia, now is the moment for each of you to prove his concern for the king, for my safety, it seems, is in your hands. The Persian nobleman bowed low, and then, without more ado, jumped overboard, and the ship, lightened of her load, came safely to her port on the Asian coast. The moment Xerxes had gone ashore, he presented the master with a gold crown as a reward for saving the king's life, and then, to punish him for causing the death of a number of Persians, cut off his head. I've said that Xerxes comes out of the histories of Herodotus as a very strange character, not devoid of humanity, but also rather frightening. Xerxes turned up on the Asian shore with a pitiful fragment of his army, and as soon as what remained of his army had access to abundant food, even more of them died because they stuffed themselves with so much food that their stomachs sometimes exploded. 
Xerxes limped back into Sardis, the provincial capital, as a thoroughly defeated man. This, however, is not the end of the war. It's not all over yet. Remember, he has left a substantial army in Greece, an army which is substantial but small enough to live off the land. And he's left his brother-in-law, Mardonius, a very competent general, in charge of this army. Mardonius winters in northern Greece, where food is more abundant. And then in 479, the following spring, he moves south at the head of, re of a reorganised army, and he reoccupies Athens. Mardonius is a competent general. He appears to be fluent in Greek. He's the man who settled the Ionian cities after the revolt by giving them local autonomy with semi-democratic institutions. Mardonius has spent the winter learning the lessons picked up at Thermopylae and reorganising the Persian army so that it will be more capable of fighting against a heavily armoured Greek army. In the spring, he moves south again, no resistance, reoccupies Athens. In Athens, he offers a diplomatic settlement to the Athenians and the Spartans in exchange for a notional surrender. All they have to do is say, all right, you went on points. At that point, Mardonius will collect a few pieces of papyrus with names on and leave Greece. He will declare a victory and go home. That's all the Greeks have to do. The Athenians look at this and they beg the Spartans for help. The Spartans say, oh no, we're not um, going north of the Peloponnese. There is no longer a serious threat to us from the Persians, so I'm afraid you'll have to deal with this by yourselves. The Athenians still refuse the offer from Mardonius, but they may not have much choice ultimately, because without Spartan heavy muscle to back up their refusal, it's pretty worthless. Then the Athenians, and I suppose Greece, and I suppose we, have a stroke of luck. Remember, Leonidas is dead, his son is a child, and you need a regent to fill up the vacated place. Pausanias, the Spartan commander of the land forces, he becomes the regent, and he insists that, for all manner of reasons, honour and, of course, the more enlightened interest of Sparta itself, requires the Spartans to send an army, an adequate army, north of the Peloponnese to see off the Persians. He gets his way, the Gerousia gives in, and Pausanias is allowed to raise and lead the biggest ever Spartan army that left the Peloponnese. 50,000 men marches off to Attica. In August 479, the numbers are notional. We don't know what the numbers were. It may have been considerably less than the numbers that I give on this slide. But it says 108,000 Greeks to 200,000 Persians. They meet at Plataea, which is west of Thebes, north of Delphi, west of Thebes. The Greeks and the Persians come face to face in a land battle. Not a land battle with a narrow pass, but they meet on the field of battle. Mardonius has spent the whole winter retraining and refitting his army so that they can fight the Greeks on a level footing. There's no doubt that the Persians fought with great bravery. They were well led by Mardonius, but they were up against a very large Spartan army. And I'll say again, whatever you want to say against the Spartans on account of their domestic arrangements doesn't cancel the fact that the Spartans probably made up the best army in the world at this time. The outcome of Plataea was that the Persian army was annihilated and Mardonius himself was killed in the battle. The superiority of Greek weapons and Greek tactics and Greek discipline was confirmed. The Persians had the final lesson they needed in Greek fighting. 
And that was the end of the Persian invasion of Greece. Xerxes has returned to Asia with the majority of his army, which, I'll repeat, shriveled away to a pitiful fragment by the time he got it back to Sardis, and the substantial army that he left in Greece under the command of Mardonius has now been destroyed, annihilated, and Mardonius himself is dead. That is the end of the Persian invasion. It ends with an overwhelming Greek victory. There is one of my artificial intelligence generated images showing the Spartan advance at Plataea. It's not bad. But there on the left, you have a contemporary representation of a fight between a Greek and a Persian. And of course, the Persian has to lose because this is a Greek painting. But you can see that the Greek has an obvious advantage. He's covered in body armour. He has a large shield. He has a heavy sword. The Persian has quilted armour, which makes for great mobility, but is no good in hand-to-hand -hand fighting with a Greek hoplite. The Persians didn't really stand a chance at Plataea. So the Persians have been cleared out of Greece, and it's now time to rebuild. Autumn 479, the Athenians reoccupy their ruined city. At this point, the Spartans step forward and make a very friendly suggestion. They tell the Athenians, you don't need to build walls around Athens. We've chased the Persians away. You have no enemies. And remember, we are your friends. You don't need walls. Don't fortify your city. If you get into any trouble in future, you can count on us to come and defend you. Themistocles looked at that promise and thought, hmm, I don't trust the Spartans one little bit. I trust them about as much as I trust the Persians. Now, the problem was that there was quite a large Spartan delegation in Athens, and you don't really want to upset the Spartans at this point because they have a large army in the area. So what Themistocles does is very quietly in the assembly to urge the rapid building of very strong walls around Athens. He then takes himself off to Sparta to extend the discussions, asking the Spartans, well, if we don't build walls around Athens, what kind of guarantees will you give us of defence should, shall we say, the Persians come back? By asking questions of this kind, Themistocles is able to keep the Spartan government in the dark. At last, in 478, the Athenians have built a new wall around their city, a very strong wall. News is sent back immediately to Sparta. Themistocles is arrested, and the Spartans feel rather let down by him. Nothing they can do, however, because the Athenians have the Spartan ambassadors, and so it's necessary f to oversee some kind of friendly, though tight-faced, exchange. There's a photograph of the walls that Themistocles had built around Athens, and you can see they were built in a tearing hurry. Those are column bases from the ruined Parthenon, the first temple of Athena. The site remained in ruins for many years until Pericles commissioned the buildings which you nowadays see on the Acropolis. Now what you can see from this is that Greek unity, which was fragile at best during the invasion, is rapidly dissolving now that the Persian threat has passed. Then the Athenians have a stroke of luck. Pausanias... He is the great Spartan general. He is the man who saw the Persians off at Plataea. In 478, he was accused of conspiring with Xerxes, of all things. It is possible, I keep on saying, the Greeks had very limited team spirit. But he was accused of conspiring with Xerxes and recalled to Sparta. The accusation was that he had offered to bring Greece under Persian control 
in return for marriage to the daughter of Xerxes. It doesn't sound very likely, but you should be prepared to believe anything of the Greeks. But he was acquitted of this. Then he was accused of conspiring to liberate the helots and to overthrow the Spartan constitution. Sounds like he was fitted up by his political enemies in Sparta. Anyway, Pausanias took refuge in the temple of Athena in Sparta. That didn't help him much. His own mother took part in bricking him into the temple until he starved to death. The Spartans were then told by an oracle that they had sinned in allowing Pausanias to starve to death in a temple of Athena, and they had to atone by putting up two statues of him. Funny lot, the Spartans. What about Themistocles? He is the hero. He is the man who won the war, because he is the man who made sure the Greeks won at Salamis. For a while, Themistocles was the darling of Athens, politically dominant for about ten years. With him able to influence the assembly, he continued the naval build-up, he builds those long walls to connect Athens to Piraeus, and he oversees the growth of Athens as a great trading power. But he does have political enemies in Athens. Also, the Spartans haven't forgiven him for the trick he pulled on them when he went to Sparta and kept them talking while the Athenians built their walls. So, in 471, the Spartans persuaded the Athenians that Themistocles was a danger to their constitution, and Themistocles was ostracised. Indeed, he wasn't just ostracised. The Spartans leaned again on the Athenians and persuaded them to put a price on his head, to bring him back to Athens to be tried for treason. And so Themistocles finds himself with nowhere to go. Well, rather, he finds himself with only one place to go. Remember where Greeks go when they get into hot water at home. Themistocles, the one man who had destroyed the Persian invasion of Greece, had no choice but to take himself off to Persia and to throw himself at the feet of the new Persian king, the son of Xerxes. The story in Plutarch is that went forward in a great crowd of people to offer prostration before the king. He then sat up and said, I am Themistocles, the man who destroyed your father's invasion of Greece, and I ask for asylum. The king looked at him and said, I'll think about this. Come back tomorrow morning. That night, the Persian king got very drunk at dinner and kept crying out, I have Themistocles the Athenian. Themistocles the Athenian is mine. Well, the next morning, Themistocles went back for a public audience with the king, and the king stood up from his throne, stood forward, and raised Themistocles to his feet and embraced him. He and Themistocles then became very good friends, and Themistocles became one of his senior advisers, and he was sent off to govern a rather important city in Asia Minor. Themistocles lived the rest of his life in peace and comfort as a servant of the great king, and his family was still living in the same city hundreds of years later in the Roman period. Rather a strange end to the man who oversaw the Greek defence. But, I'll say again, the Greeks were often a rather strange people. After his death, the Athenians decided that Themistocles hadn't been so bad, and they rehabilitated him. But as I've said, his family didn't return to Athens, it stayed in Asia Minor, and was still there in Roman times, still notable in the city where they'd settled. Oh, and there's one of those ostracons, there's one of those pottery shards on which the Athenians could write the names of the people they wanted to be kicked out of Athens for ten years. So that's the end of Themistocles. Oh, yes, the Battle of Mycale. Same day as Plataea, 479 BC. This is in the eastern Aegean. A Greek fleet 
under the Spartan king Leotikides, arrives off Samos. Remember, that's the place where Polycrates was the tyrant. Their purpose is to continue the attack on the Persian fleet in the Aegean. The Persian fleet was in a poor state of repair, so the ships were pulled onto the beach, and they were protected by a large but a very dispirited army of 60,000 men. Spartans decided to attack the Persian camp, but there were a few of them, a few thousand at the most. The Persians look at this small Greek army, and they suddenly take heart, and they come out of the camp to fight. Once again, Greek tactics, Greek armour, Greek discipline... They show their advantage, and the Persian army is destroyed. The Persian ships were abandoned and captured and burned by the Greeks. And after this, the Persians lost control of the Aegean. That was the end of the Persian threat to Greece. Their armies had been driven out of Greece, and now their fleets have been swept from the Aegean Sea. This didn't mean the end of the war. There were continuing hostilities for decades afterwards, though I wouldn't put too much on that. It's now become a bit of a dogfight. Sometimes the Persians try their luck. Usually they come off worse. It is the end of the war. The war ended in 479, really. As I say, the hostilities dragged on and on, but they didn't amount to anything. The Greeks have won. They have defeated the greatest empire so far in history. They've defeated it totally, so totally that there is no longer any military threat to Greece, and the Persians have almost no naval presence in the Aegean. What can one say about the aftermath? I'll come to Xerxes in a moment. Over the next few decades, the Greeks used or rather the Athenians used their naval supremacy in the Aegean to push the Persians out of all the Greek cities along the western coast of Asia Minor. One after another, those Ionian cities were liberated, and they were incorporated into an Athenian alliance or an Athenian empire, a kind of early NATO, you might call it, which is an organisation obviously under American leadership. The Greek cities along the western coast of Asia, plus the islands, plus many cities on the mainland, were incorporated into the Delian League, so-called because the treasury of the League was kept at Delos, an island in the middle of the Aegean, then it was moved to Athens, where it was perhaps put to better use for building the Acropolis buildings that we see today. And so after a generation, Athens is a radical democracy, which is also at the heart of quite a large empire of islands and coastal cities. And these are all protected by Athenian power against any attempt by the Persians at reconquest. And we're now deep into the 5th century, which is the golden age of art and philosophy and political democracy. Wonderful and remarkable things happened in Athens during that 5th century. It was the equivalent of our own Renaissance and Enlightenment. But I'll say more about that next week. What I'll do at the moment is I will quote Herodotus. Mostly when Herodotus wants to give a general opinion, he will insinuate it. It's not very often that he turns to the reader and speaks directly, but here in Book 7 he does this. At this point, I find myself compelled to express an opinion which I know most people will object to. Nevertheless, as I believe it to be true, I will not suppress it. If the Athenians, through fear of the approaching danger, had abandoned their country, or if they had stayed there and submitted to Xerxes, there would have been no attempt to resist the Persians by sea. And in the absence of a Greek fleet, it is easy to see what would have been the course of events on land. However many lines of fortification the Spartans had built across the Isthmus of Corinth, 
they would have been deserted by their confederates, for I cannot myself see what possible use there could have been in fortifying the isthmus if the Persians had command of the sea. In view of this, therefore, one is surely right in saying that Greece was saved by the Athenians. And, after 2,400 years, it is very difficult to, to disagree with this judgment of Herodotus. The Athenians saved the Greeks, and because of that you have the Golden Age of Greece, and because of that you have the Roman Golden Age, and you have Medieval Europe, and Europe of the Renaissance, and of the Enlightenment, and of the Industrial Revolution, and you have us here today talking each other over Zoom. I'm not saying that nothing good would have happened had Greece lost that war, but it would not have happened as it did. So, although this is a war that happened a very long time ago, it remains a war of the greatest importance for our history and even our own identity. Remember I quoted John Stuart Mill a few weeks ago, who said with great firmness that the outcome of the Battle of Marathon was an event of greater importance in English history than the outcome of the Battle of Hastings. Again, I don't see any reason to disagree with that, and I would add Salamis to Marathon. Both of them battles won by the Athenians. What about Xerxes? After this humiliating defeat, he went back to Persepolis and never left again. He shut himself inside his rather large and luxurious palace, and spent the rest of his life engaged in building projects and overseeing intrigues in his own harem. In 465, he was murdered by the head of his own bodyguard, and he was succeeded by his son Artaxerxes, and by his other descendants down to the time when Darius III was defeated by Alexander. It was quite a brutal murder, and there's a representation of it, artificial intelligence again, because I couldn't find a decent representation of the murder of Xerxes. The question arising is, was this defeat a serious blow to the Persian Empire? If you take a modern analogy, in 1839 we invaded Afghanistan and we were kicked out with great humiliation in 1842, losing our army in the process, losing an army in the process. The Afghans might have celebrated this as a crushing win against the British, but did it have any effect on the growth and the stability and prosperity of the British Empire? Obviously not. Now, could it be that the Persian invasion of Greece was rather like our first invasion of Afghanistan? An embarrassing reverse, but not something that you bear in mind for very long, and not something that worries anybody else. It's hardly the case that the French, the Americans, or anybody else looked at this reverse in Afghanistan and said, ah, now's our time to take the British on at sea. No, it was a little local difficulty, and that was the end of it. Is that what losing the invasion of Greece did to the Persians? Some historians think, yes, that is the case. This was skirmish on the eastern fringes of their empire, a long way from the densely populated, prosperous parts around Persepolis, around Babylon. But Xerxes did lead an enormous army into Europe, and he did lose all of it, and he lost control over the Aegean. It was a signal defeat, and it is possible to say that this is the reason, this is one of the causes, perhaps, why the Persians fell into not a long period of chaos, but they fell into a period of growing decadence. This was not the end of the Persians. I've said that hostilities dragged on for decades, and at the end of the century, the Persians still had the wherewithal to take their revenge on the Athenians. But the Persian Empire is no longer an expansive force in the world after this defeat. 
the Persians settle down to make the best of what they already have. So it could be that the defeat in the Greek invasion finished the expansive period of Persian imperial history. It may have been a defeat that echoed around the known world, but we don't know. But it does seem that the defeat of Xerxes' vast army of invasion was a significant blow to the prestige of the Persians. But there it is. There's the map again, showing the Athenian Empire, or the Athenian-led Delian League, which kept the Persians out of those Greek-speaking areas of Western Asia for several generations. And there on the left, you have the remains of the Serpent Column, which was put up as a victory monument in Delphi. On it, you have inscribed the names of all the cities which took part in the resistance to the Persian invasion. The reason this is in the middle of Istanbul nowadays is because when the capital of the Roman Empire was shifted from Rome to Constantinople, this new great city of Constantine was beautified by stripping virtually the entire eastern Mediterranean of its most outstanding works of art. And the Serpent Column was taken from Delphi to stand in the Hippodrome, where the chariot races used to take place. It was still complete in the 15th century, when some Italian artists portrayed it, but between the 15th and the 20th centuries, the three heads of the serpent column were knocked off. I believe one of the serpent heads is in the National Archaeological Museum in Istanbul. I was there in the autumn of 2022, and I didn't notice it. But there is one of the victory monuments put up by the triumphant Greeks after this miraculous salvation of Greece. Now, I could say much more, but that is an overview of the great Persian invasion of Greece. Next week, I want to say something about the Golden Age of Athens, which is the Golden Age of Greece. And I want to talk as well about that terrible war between Athens and Sparta. But for the moment, I've said all that I can. Does anybody have any questions?